And I want to just read these couple of passages um, to really set the, the stage. Uh, and the one is from Luke, and the other is from, uh, from the Acts of the Apostles. So here we have the one from Acts. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up into heaven. After giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized by the Holy Spirit. After he had said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. So that's Acts 1, 1 to 11. Few things in life are more exhilarating and fulfilling than the crowning celebration of some great achievement. And today we recall one such crowning moment in biblical history, the ascension of our Lord Jesus Christ. It was not just the culmination of Jesus' earthly ministry, but the beginning of a new phase of his ministry. Before we look at the implications and the significance of it, just a remark on why it is that the Gospel writers did not give much time and space to the ascension of Christ. Matthew and John do not even refer to it. Mark sums it up in one verse, and Luke speaks about it only in his parting words. So why should this be? We should remember that the Gospels were essentially written to declare the message of salvation, the saving work of Christ through his life, death, and resurrection. It's not that Jesus' ascension was unimportant, but that it was largely irrelevant to the purpose for their Gospel accounts. Okay, let me just read this. What was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we beheld and our hands handled concerning the word of life, and the life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested to us. What we have seen and heard we proclaim to you also. From 1 John 1, 1 to 3. Unlike us, the disciples lived, walked, talked, and touched Jesus while he was here on earth. Whenever he spoke of leaving them, we read that they were deeply distressed. It was not something they had anticipated or even wanted to think about. And we're the same. When we lose a loved one, we tend not to reminisce or dwell on their departure, even though we anticipate spending eternity with them in the presence of our Lord. We would rather dwell on their lives, which is what these writers did. And I say it every year, we must not forget the ascension of our Lord. It must not be ignored, for as we will see, the ascension of Christ is a crucial event in God's whole plan of salvation. It is this glorious ascension that is the culmination of the atoning work of Christ, the guarantee of his promises, the proof of his claims, and the beginning of his reign over all the earth. From the days of the early church, the Nicene Creed reminds us that Christ Jesus 
ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of the Father, and he shall come with glory to judge both the quick and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. The creed only affirms what the Bible already teaches, that after the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, after he appeared to various people and groups, he departed from his disciples on the Mount of Olives. That is, he had ascended from the earth in the clouds and entered into the heavenly courts where he will be exalted forever and ever. And so the question that we are asking this evening is really what is the significance? What are the implications of Christ's ascension? And we look at many of these from year to year, and it's always a wonderful reminder to us of what the ascension really means for us today. So at his ascension, Jesus returned home to glory to prepare a place for us. And we were talking about that just this morning in the service that we did for my mom-in-law. At his ascension, Jesus returned home to glory to continue preparing a place for us. This is the basic meaning of the ascension. He returned to heaven, to the angels, to the glory he had before the foundation of the world. He ascended to heaven in his resurrected bodily form, from the human place on earth to his Father's place in heaven. It was not a journey into outer space. Rather, he ascended and was removed from space and time into the immediate presence of Almighty God. For he had descended into time and space when he came into the world to save us from sin. And yet his rightful place was in glory. And so he prayed that his Father would glorify him with the glory that he had before the foundation of the world. And so when his earthly task was completed, that prayer was answered. And you can just imagine the angelic reception that he got when he came home. Jesus said he would go to prepare a place for us, so that where he was, we could also be. He wants us to share in his heavenly home. His mission was not merely to rescue us from judgment, it was to bring us home to him, so that we might be with him forever. Paul says in Ephesians that we are already seated in the heavenlies, because we are in him. Our future is certain. Heaven is our home, not this world, friends. This whole life is a preparation for glory. We are in the world, but not of the world. We are told not to store up for ourselves treasures on earth. That is not simply material gain. We should not engage in petty competitions, little power plays, desires for worldly fame, and often the dishonest, dishonest and selfish ways of gaining such. Our faith in Christ is the means of victory over the world. We must measure everything by heavenly standards, by spiritual eternal things. Why? Because we don't belong here. And the more that we grow in the Lord, the more we become like Him, the more we will realize that we do not belong here. And this kind of perspective will influence all of our choices. When we enter into worship, we catch a glimpse of that glory, just a tiny glimpse. For a few moments in time, we are transported into the presence of Jesus. We enter that place by faith. But there will come a day when we will enter that place with our own resurrected bodies. Heaven is our inheritance. And Jesus' ascension assures us of the way home. So, Jesus returned home to glory to continue to prepare that place for us. So in his ascension, Jesus entered heaven to complete his work of salvation. And so the writer of the book of Hebrews explains it well. 
two aspects. First of all, Jesus offered himself as the perfect sacrifice. Using the imagery of the earthly temple, which was but a shadow of the heavenly temple, the very presence of God the Father, the writer explains how Jesus, our high priest, took the sacrifice himself into the presence of God, thereby completing the transaction. In Christ we have access into the presence of God. So let's just read this passage from Hebrews that really explains that so beautifully. So, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, open for us through the curtain, that is his body. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promises, promised, is faithful. So, as we are saying, first of all, Jesus offered himself as that perfect sacrifice. But secondly, Jesus is also our living high priest who forever lives to intercede for us. Through his incarnation, Jesus revealed the Father to us so that we might see God in Christ. But through his ascension, Jesus reveals us to the Father. And God sees Christ in us. As our high priest, Jesus presents our, our work, our prayers, our worship in an acceptable way to the Father. All that we do here passes through our mediator to our Heavenly Father. And in that way it's perfected. So even though our worship is so imperfect, when it comes to the Father, it is perfected. Without the presence of Christ in heaven and the indwelling Spirit here on earth, our prayers and praise would be utterly inadequate. The high priest as our representative, takes into the presence of God all that we do and offers it to the Father for us. And the Father is satisfied. And when we sin, Paul says, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one, who declares that our sins have been paid for once and for all. What an incredible picture that is. That when we sin... Paul says we have this advocate with the Father, Jesus the Righteous One. We are talking about that last night in our orientation course, who declares that our sins have been paid for once and for all. So thirdly, in his ascension, Jesus sat down on the right hand of the Father in glory. To be seated at the right hand of God the Father was a place of honor, was a place of power and authority. In other words, the ascension meant Christ's coronation. And his second coming will mark the beginning of his eternal reign. And so through his exaltation to the right hand of God, and we've obviously got to understand that figuratively and not literally, Jesus shares the universal rule of the cosmos with the Father. And so that's why Jesus said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. In other words, through his ascension, that authority that Jesus has is transferred to us. We are ambassadors of the King. So his ascension means that Jesus sat down at the right hand of God in glory. Then, fourthly, at his ascension, Jesus sent the Holy Spirit into the world. And this is crucial, friends. It is from his throne that he and the Father sent the Spirit to the church. The ascension of Christ was to change how each of the disciples, as individuals and as a group, would relate to the risen Savior. 
Jesus was no longer walking with them. He was no longer eating fish with them or personally instructing them from the Scriptures. Jesus would not merely walk with them now. He would actually indwell each one of them through the Holy Spirit. And so the, the ascension paves the way for the coming of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was sent into the world to continue the work of Jesus Christ so that we might do the will of God in the same way that Jesus performed the will of God. It is the Holy Spirit who unites the people of God to the risen and exalted Savior. It is the Spirit who ensures that all of the benefits of Christ's life his death and his resurrection become ours. And so that's a crucial reason for the ascension. And then lastly, by his ascension, Jesus demonstrated how he will come again. And so in Acts 1.11 that we read, we, uh, the writer records the words of the angels that this same Jesus, whom they saw go into heaven, will come in a like manner as they saw him go. It will be an actual return of Christ into space and time. But of course, it will just be so much more glorious. He will come, we read, in the clouds of glory. And we who remain, the Bible says, will ascend along with those who are raised from the dead. And we will all be changed, we read, in a twinkling of an eye, and we will be with the Lord forever. And so through the ascension of Jesus, we have this glorious hope that he will return and gather to himself all those who belong to Christ. What a wonderful picture. What a wonderful hope we have, friends. So Jesus demonstrated how he will come again. So let me conclude. We are saved through the birth, the life, the death, the resurrection, and the glorification of our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ's ascension and glorification is the final declaration to the world of his victory over death and Satan. Behind him is the persecution of men, and before him is the applause of angels. Behind him is a cross, before him lies a crown. Behind him is Calvary. Before him is all of heaven's glory. And so the ascension declares for all time that Jesus is the eternal Son of God. It was part of the eternal plan of God that was established before the, the creation of the world. God determined to create human beings in his image, enable them to triumph over evil, and then exalt them into glory. And friends, this is the joy and the hope of every believer. That in Christ Jesus we have access to the throne room of God. And we enter that throne room by faith. We do that even now. But one day in the future, we will all enter into it in reality. And so because Christ ascended, so shall we. And we too shall stand in the presence of God, completed, perfected, and glorified. And so, the resurrection of Jesus is not just, or rather the ascension of Jesus, is not just something that, you know, we, we remember 40 days after his resurrection. The significance, the implications are so crucial. And I honestly believe that this day is almost more important 
than Christmas Day. And yet on Christmas Day, we'll have a church full to capacity, two services jammed with people because of the incarnation. But friends, where would we be without the ascension? Jesus returned home to glory to prepare a place for us. In his ascension, Jesus entered heaven to complete the work of salvation. In his ascension, he sat down on the right hand of the Father in glory, basically demonstrating his authority and his power. Through his ascension, Jesus was able to send the Holy Spirit to empower us to continue the work that he began. And through his ascension, he demonstrated that he will come back again. That is the whole story. And if we only celebrate the incarnation and we only celebrate the resurrection, we are not celebrating the whole story of Christ. The whole story, in fact, is that he ascended. And the continuation of that story is, happens next Sunday, not this Sunday, next Sunday, on the day of Pentecost, ten days after his ascension, when exactly what we said, <clears throat> he sends the Holy Spirit to empower his church. And I really pray that we all be here on that day as we talk about the Holy Spirit. And so on that note, we're going to close, and I pray that you'll go home this evening just thinking about those five things, thinking of how he goes to prepare a place for us, thinking of how he completes that work of salvation in glory, how he's seated on the right hand of God the Father, and so he therefore gives us that authority to go into all the world and spread the good news, how he sends the Holy Spirit as a result of his ascension, and how he demonstrates. Uh, what is the last one? Demonstrates what? Let me ask you. Yeah, I see. Have you been listening? Yeah. So, how he demonstrates... This slipped my mind as well. <laughs> yeah, I've had a long day. So what is it? Come on, tell me. How he demonstrates he's going to come again. Soon and very soon, we're going to see the king. He's going to come again. Amen. Okay, so uh, the examination on this message tonight will be next week. And I want all five to be on the list, eh? All five.